When it was announced to the world earlier this year that Jimmy Carter had cancer, there was universal prayers for the man who has spent his post-presidential years making this world a much better place to live. Our first thought was that we needed to bring someone in to talk about it. We feel this special bond to Jimmy Carter since he was the Forum Club's inaugural speaker back when he was running for president back in 1976. He was new to the game of politics back then, and quite frankly, so was the Forum Club. There were 200 founding members of the Forum Club back when it was organized, 1976. 20 of those members remain members today. In fact, several of them bought tickets to today's program. If you are one of the original remaining 20, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Ambassador Marianne Peters is here today to talk about Jimmy Carter's legacy. For the past year, she has served as, as CEO of the Carter Center and oversees all program implementation and operations. Ambassador Peters was provost of the U.S. Naval War College from 2008 to 2014. Previously, she was dean in academics at the College of International and Securities at the George Marshall European Center for Securities in Germany. She spent more than 30 years as a career diplomat with the United States Department of State. From 2000 to 2003, she was the U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh, leading the mission's efforts in support of the war on terrorism. She received a Presidential Meritorious Service Award for her work there. Fluent in an underachieving six languages, <laughs> Ambassador Peters also served as Deputy Chief of Mission of the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa, Canada, and in the White House as Director for European and Canadian Affairs for the National Security Council. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Mary Ann Peters. Good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to be here during the 40th anniversary celebration of the Forum Club of the Palm Beaches. And it's a personal privilege for me to be a bookend of sorts for your first 40 years, marking the fact that your very first speaker was then presidential candidate Jimmy Carter. When he heard I would be here, President Carter wrote a letter of greeting to the Forum Club members that I'd like to read now. Dear friends, I am pleased to extend warm regards to the Forum Club of the Palm Beaches and to congratulate you on becoming Florida's largest nonpartisan political and public affairs organization. Since having the honor of being your club's inaugural speaker 40 years ago, Palm Beach County has held a special place in my heart. It was home to some of my strongest early supporters, many of whom I met for the first time at that 1976 event. I also recall fondly the historic Helen Wilkes Hotel built the year I was born, <laughs> 1924, for those of you who don't, who don't know. Um, I was, oh, I'm sorry, it says the year before I was born, so that would be 1923. I was saddened to learn that Helen, a native Georgian, passed away this month. She did so much to bolster both the business and political structures of her beloved adopted city. The Forum Club stands out for its contributions to sustaining a progressive, tolerant, and participatory community, steadfastly fulfilling the goals its founders set four decades ago. I especially commend the club's mission of educating its members, other citizens, and particularly students about public policy in an open and nonpartisan way, allowing space for dialogue that is missing from so many aspects of American public life. Since leaving the White House, Rosalind and I have been dedicated to creating and strengthening the Carter Center, whose programs to promote peace and health worldwide also are nonpartisan in nature. Thank you for inviting Ambassador Peters to speak to you today. I hope you will enjoy our CEO's presentation about some of the Center's key accomplishments. With warm best wishes, Jimmy Carter. And now I would like to present the original of that letter to your president, Ed Chase. Ed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, 
So as you all know, candidate Carter went on to become President Carter, and then he went on to live what just about everyone agrees is an inspiring and productive post-presidency. Through the Carter Center, President and Mrs. Carter have had an enormous impact in alleviating suffering and promoting human rights around the world. And I would say that their impact has been just as important here in the United States as an example of how we, as Americans, can live up to our own precious ideals. I'd like to start by showing you the video that was made uh, to celebrate President Carter's 90th birthday on October 1st, 2014. John, would you roll the video? dream of a nation where freedom would endure the working prayers of centuries have brought us to this day what shall be our legacy what will our children say let them say the gifts they were given were determined to leave more battles fought together acts of conscience fought alone
Isn't that a fabulous uh, tribute? Um, the Carter Center was established in 1982, initially to focus on peace and conflict resolution, but the center soon became active in projects to improve the health of the world's poorest and most forgotten people, which President Carter sees as a fundamental component both of human rights and of a truly sustainable peace. The Carter Center motto is waging peace, fighting disease, building hope. The center has worked in more than 80 countries and at any given time you'll find us working in about half that many. Our health programs are now focused largely on eradicating or eliminating neglected tropical diseases in Africa and Latin America, although we have a robust mental health program that is primarily focused in this country. Our peace programs can be grouped under three broad rubrics, human rights, democracy, and conflict resolution. And today I'm going to talk about just a few of our programs. But first, one thing I've come to realize in my year at the Carter Center is that the center's unique character is based not only on what we do, but on how we do it. And that is where President Carter's stamp has been indelible. There are a number of operating principles that reflect um, his philosophy. One is that the Carter Center is not a think tank, nothing wrong with think tanks, but that's not what it is. We like to say we are data-driven and action-oriented and focused on impact. The second principle is that the Carter Center does not duplicate the effective efforts of others. And this is harder than you would think. Uh, it means that uh, by not duplicating the efforts of others, we know we are going to be dealing with difficult problems in difficult uh, situations. Like the Forum Club, the center is nonpartisan. Our programs are based on compassion and values that are shared by Americans across our political spectrum. Uh, and Oz Nelson, a longtime member of our board and the outgoing chair, is himself a proud Republican. Some of you may know him. He said he has friends here in this area. And the final mission principle, and I quote, is the center believes that people can improve their own lives when provided with the necessary skills, knowledge, and access to resources. What this means essentially is that we don't feel we work for people or for the poor, but with people, with the people we seek to help. And this last principle is uh, essentially about the core value of human dignity. The Carter Center often works at the end of the road with people who have basically nothing but their dignity. So the first program I want to describe illustrates President Carter's respect for human dignity. And it is the Carter Center's 30-year battle to eradicate a terrible affliction that I had never heard of, frankly, um, guinea worm disease. We hope this will be the second human disease to be eradicated from the face of the earth after smallpox, although I'm happy to tell you that polio is also on the cusp of eradication. Because guinea worm disease is rarely fatal and because it affects only the very poor, there really wasn't much interest in fighting it when the Carter Center began this campaign in the 1980s. No one here in this room will ever have a, a long white worm come out of our bodies, and nor will anyone we know suffer that, um, that fate. But as you will see, this disease is an assault on human dignity. It causes serious pain and sometimes permanent damage, and it has immense economic consequences for people who are already struggling. And people who get guinea worm disease don't even have the luxury of becoming immune. They can suffer multiple worms year after year. Thank you for putting up slide one. This uh, shows the life cycle of the worm, and this cycle has been used as a teaching tool um, throughout the um, places where we work to eradicate guinea worm, and I think you can see the cycle begins with a sufferer soaking an affected limb in water. And the worm, I hope you've all finished eating, the worm explodes and releases um, its larvae into the water, and uh, the cycle continues. Slide two, please. Next one. 
Here, obviously, our president and Mrs. Carter with a young guinea worm sufferer. You can see the worm in the inset on the right. And in this case, the worm is coming out of the little girl's foot, but it can emerge anywhere on the body. When the Carter Center began to fight this disease 30 years ago, there were 3.5 million cases worldwide every year. And thanks to our team of guinea worm warriors, that's what we call them, the vast majority of whom are community level volunteers, last year the number of cases worldwide was only 126 in just four countries. Chad, Molly, thank you. Ah, but wait. Chad, Mali, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. This year, at the end of October, we have only 18 cases. Now. So we're, uh, and President Carter, as you may have noticed, during the press conference in August when he announced his illness, he did say that one of his ambitions is to outlive the last worm. And we actually, I actually have said to our Vice President for Health Programs that our goal is now to see that last worm in a tequila bottle <laughs> on President Carter's desk <laughs> in the very near future. So uh, what's especially inspiring about the progress against this disease is that there's no cure, no vaccine, no therapeutic drug for guinea worm disease. The only way to eradicate it is to educate people to change their behavior in two ways. Next slide, please. In the absence of universal access to clean water, and we are a long way from that, as this slide illustrates all too well, the first change people must make is to filter the water they drink. Using cloth filters on buckets at the water source as shown here, next slide, please. Um, oh, well, that's actually this one. And small filtered pipes like this when they are in the field. And I'm actually wearing one. Uh, it has a small piece of, of filter inside, large, uh, small enough to uh, eliminate the, what are they called, cocoa pods that have swallowed the larvae and that are what infect, reinfect the human body. Next slide, please. The other way people need to modify their behavior to interrupt transmission is to stay out of the village water source while the worm is emerging, and that requires education. The Carter Center has built a network of tens of thousands of community volunteers who've helped educate people in 23,600 villages about the guinea worm, and they use creative ways to do that education. Uh, we have posters, we even have a special cloth that um, is woven that shows basically the cycle of guinea worm disease and in the people who wear and, and uh, see the cloth can understand what they have to do to avoid getting it. Immersing the affected area, as you saw earlier, helps to alleviate the pain, but it's uh, also the way the guinea worm larvae survive. So the sufferers have to stay out of the water for the good of their communities, and they do that once they have the knowledge to make that change and the filters to drink clean water. The second initiative I want to highlight today illustrates another core value that the center has learned from President and Mrs. Carter, and that is trust. This particular initiative was not designed in Atlanta, but in Liberia during the terrifying outbreak of Ebola last year and early this year. First, just to be clear, the Carter Center does not deal with pandemics. We don't field the heroes who don those hazmat suits and take care of patients. But we were able to bridge the trust gap in Liberia, and that helped enable the authorities and health professionals there to interrupt the transmission of the disease earlier than uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea were able to do. Next slide, please. The Carter Center had been working in Liberia for a number of years through programs to heal the wounds of a brutal 15-year civil war uh, and encourage democratization. Our Access to Justice program worked with what we call customary leadership, tribal chiefs, women elders, to resolve local disputes stemming from the Civil War. 
So the Carter Center team in Liberia, mainly Liberians, not all, but mainly, knew and trusted these people, and they knew and trusted us. But they did not trust the messages they were hearing from the government. Imagine that. And they persisted in using traditional burial methods, which require extensive touching of the deceased and actually are a guaranteed way to ensure the spread of Ebola. Now, the Carter Center, because we were known and trusted by individual people, was able to convince the tribal chiefs, uh, at least the vast majority of them, that traditional burial methods indeed transmitted the disease, something they just didn't believe when they first heard it. I'm going to read an excerpt from an interview with our director in Liberia, Pee Wee Flamoco. Quote, there was the issue of trust. For instance, the first message the people heard was that if you have Ebola, you will die. So then people were scared and fear set in. We had to change the message from you will die to if you look after yourself, you will not get Ebola to you can survive. The message was you can survive if you stay away from making contact. Do not bury your loved ones the way you have always done it. Do not conduct a secret burial. Do not braid their hair or wash their bodies. The message was do not touch. It was difficult because people would call for burial support and the response would take time. And it was so difficult not to touch the dead person, especially a child. Continuing to quote from Pee Wee, women were always exposed. When a child is sick, the mother makes the first contact. That is why we targeted the messages to women. Mothers knew that getting exposed themselves would expose their families, so they took measures. Maybe more women didn't listen, I'm sorry, maybe more men didn't listen to the do's and don'ts, and maybe more women did. Women always care, so they were the leaders in this thing. And that's the end of my quote from Mr. Flamoco's uh, interview. But at the Carter Center, this experience in Liberia, where we were able to repurpose an existing program to help in a true emergency, has reinforced our commitment to building networks of trust as a foundation for our programs. And there's still plenty of work to do in Liberia, the mental health workers whom we had trained before the outbreak of Ebola are now helping first responders and children, mostly orphans, to deal with and recover from the serious mental health wounds they sustained during the Ebola outbreak. Before we move to questions, I'd like to describe one more program that illustrates another core value of President Carter's. Um, and that uh, is the importance of working with faith communities and religious leaders. Historically, as you may know, there has been very little overlap between religious leaders and the largely secular human rights movement. In fact, the two groups rarely speak to each other, except at the Carter Center. As the president who introduced human rights into foreign policy and a believer himself, President Carter has unique credibility in bridging this gap. So every year, the Carter Center hosts a Human Rights Defenders Symposium. And for the past several years, the topic has been the status of women and the role of religion in improving that status. I'd like to show a brief clip from that forum. I think we might have to skip the next slide and move to the short video, please. I hope that one of the results of this conference will be to strengthen every one of us individually to speak out forcefully and to use whatever influence we can marshal to bring about improvements in the treatment of women. Religious and civic leaders, human rights defenders, and scholars from around the world came to the Carter Center for three days in June to challenge people of faith to stand up for women's rights and demand equality for everyone. God cannot be God if God is unjust. It is as simple as that. So we were searching for justice, we were searching for equality, we were searching for compassion, and we found that in the Quran. If we are equal in the eyes of God, how come we're not equal in the eyes of men in this world? In Africa, 
There's a lot of suppression. There's a lot of discrimination for women. For the first time in Liberian history, we had 14 women represented in the national legislature. Mm -hmm. And they're all because of the effort that women said our voices need to be heard. I, being a person of faith in a democratic culture, I expect to use my voice and to be required to use my voice. And I find our text mandating that I use my voice in the gifts that I'm given. You don't hide your gifts. What women do, I think, probably best, is have lived experience that informs how they engage in the world. And when we share our stories together, then we develop power to create change because it's based in reality. There is a piece of joy. There is joy is released when we touch the pain of our time. Many people think that there is no large scale problem with human trafficking or slavery. As we look at trafficking overall worldwide, trafficking is the number two criminal enterprise in the world, uh, second only to guns. And if there's ever an opportunity for the faith community to come together and end modern day slavery, it's now. People can feel very discouraged. They can feel like this is how it always is. Don't be politically naive. These are situations of, that are just culturally um, resonant and nothing's ever going to change. And so often the interruptive voices of women aren't honored. But a conference like this says, no, pay attention to the interruption. We learn new ideas, best practices, and then when we go back home, we will be able to approach our local work with more confidence, knowing that um, uh, we're not alone. I know she called on the Carter Center to play a role, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that makes us not fearful, but proud. And we'll do the best we can. So I'm proud to say that in early December, the Carter Center will convene a follow-up forum in West Africa on women's rights in the context of religion and faith. The goal of the forum is to enlist religious leaders, Christian and Muslim, to discourage practices that masquerade in these cultures as religion, such as female genital mutilation, early marriage, or honor killing, and to encourage the education of girls. As one of the co-leaders of the forum, Sheikh Sharabutu said recently, the forum will address some of the religious texts that are misquoted or wrongfully used to justify abuses of women and girls. I hope these descriptions have helped explain why President Carter regards the Carter Center as his chief legacy. At the press conference in August, where he talked about his diagnosis, he actually said that if forced to choose between a second term as president and the work of the Carter Center, he would choose the latter. Once again, thank you for inviting me to talk about President Carter's journey since he spoke at the Forum Club nearly 40 years ago. As I understand your history, the Forum Club has been on a journey too, and its journey and President Carter's intersect in their devotion to the practical ideals of democracy, to educating in the broadest sense of the world, a word, and to respect for all, even those we disagree with. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, let's start with our questions from our students. Up first, we'll have two questions from the students from Seminole Ridge High School. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Turkovich from Ms. Carbone's AP government class at Seminole Ridge High School. And my question is, um, during this upcoming presidential election season, what advice do you think President Carter would give to the candidates? <laughs> Oh, you know, that's a tricky one, and I'm not sure I, I want to repeat what I really think he would say. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, think, I think he might say uh, something along the lines of the fact that um, we have serious problems and the candidates are not always um, behaving uh, as seriously as, as they should. I think he might say that, and I think um, he might encourage people to uh, look across the aisle for solutions to some of our um, worst problems.
Good afternoon, Ambassador. I'm Adrian Fernandez from the AP Government and Politics uh, class from Seminole Ridge. And my question is, the exodus from Syria is a serious humanitarian crisis. And I am wondering what the Carter Center is doing to help the millions of refugees fleeing Syria. Well, to tell you the truth, we are not helping the refugees directly, but we are deeply engaged uh, in a quiet way behind the scenes in diplomacy to uh, end the, the crisis there. Now, President Carter himself has written about it publicly, but the Carter Center's conflict resolution program has been working for years behind the scenes to bring together some of the actors to try to define the space for a solution. In other words, to define a set of principles that could at least form the basis for an eventual negotiation. We also have something called the Syria Mapping Project, which is groundbreaking. We do a lot of low-tech work, as you heard. Our guinea worm program is basically a very low-tech program based on um, working with the people who are affected. But the Syria Mapping Project is pretty high-tech. May I have uh, the first of those backup slides, please? Yes. Um, these uh, slides appeared in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, and they are the result of um, uh, a project that uses technology uh, given to the Carter Center by Palantir Incorporated that uh, uses social media and other you know, digital information to map the conflict, and our maps are very, very good. Now, we share the uh, real-time data only with humanitarian organizations on the ground so that they can get assistance to people. But maps like these are available to the public on our website because they are um, they're the result of analysis and they're not real time what we call actionable uh, intelligence. So in those two ways, next slide please. And uh, next slide, I'll just show you several of the slides that we have. And is there another one? I think there's one more. Thank you. Um, so th these, uh, these slides provide the ability for humanitarian organizations to safely get relief to people in need. That and stopping the conflict, I think, are two ways in which we can persuade people to stay in Syria. Uh, but I don't know about you. If I were there, I might want to leave. I might want to leave, too. Thank you. And before we go to the Oxford Academy, if you have a question from the floor, please raise your card and one of our volunteers will pick it up and bring it up to the front table. Good afternoon. I am Alex Wong from Oxford Academy and I'm currently in Mr. Curtis's uh, honors government class. And my question for you is, on the Carter Center list of peace initiatives, it includes the combating of ISIS through the countering of their propaganda. Do you think that countries in general should be pursuing a more uh, punitive measures against ISIS? Well, you know, that depends. And that um, I may answer in a minute from my, my personal perspective. But let me first talk about the project that you refer to. What we are trying to do is something a little different from the many programs, some of them good, some of them a little naive, that uh, exist to combat um, in the CVE field. Com combating vi uh, violent extremism has become the, the tag phrase. But the, the Carter Center program that we're just starting up is a little different in that we are seeking to an analyze the recruitment messages that ISIS puts out that have lured young people to a fate much worse than they deserve even for signing up for ISIS um, because they're young and they can't expect it, you know, they're young, they're children. Uh, and we are going to analyze the entire content of the message, not just the words. There are a lot of projects out there to analyze the words, particularly verses from the Quran, that extremist groups use to recruit and then to try to find texts that counter those. 
That's a small part of our project, but the real part is to analyze the images, the music, the entire message from a sophisticated viewpoint. We're gonna be working with media scholars. You'll find, or at least I've been told by our experts, that most of the recruits are responding not to videos of beheadings, but to images of people eating together peaceably around a refectory table. In other words, to a promise of community. Okay, it's a lie, but that's what they're responding to. So first, we're going to gather scholars to analyze the messages, and then we're gonna take that analysis to a group of religious leaders in certain countries. And by leaders, I mean in this case, really um, neighborhood and community leaders. Uh, we have help from universities in, in Beirut and Morocco and other places identifying these people, and we will work with them to see how they think they can preach um, and talk to discourage people in their communities, in their congregations, from buying the, the lie that is the recruitment. So I think that project has value because it's a little different from many of the other projects I've seen. But as far as the more general question on combating ISIS, my simple political analysis is that ISIS is a function of Sunni discontent and that therefore the only way to permanently defeat ISIS is to have uh, Sunnis disavow it. Otherwise, of course, the dead will become martyrs and, um, and it will never die. The other thing about ISIS that may prove, uh, provide a little bit of vulnerability is that it does claim to be a caliphate. Unlike Al-Qaeda, which is purely ideological, ISIS has to have territory in order to validate its claim to be a caliphate. Well, they've won a lot of territory, but what can be, what, you know, you can also lose territory. So that could be an eventual weakness, but we haven't really had much success in exploiting it, and I don't think the success will be permanent unless and until the, uh, counter, the counter force has a significant Sunni component. Thank you. Thank you, students. We have a couple of questions about before we run out of time here. Here's a personal one for you. How does a 30-year career diplomat with the Department of State wind up running a war college? Seriously. <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you a slightly different story. Um, I'm going to tell you how a provost of a war college winds up the C as the CEO of a, an organization dedicated to waging peace. And that'll actually answer your question. So uh, when the chair of our board, Oz Nelson, formerly chair and, and CEO of UPS, introduced me to the Carter Center staff, he said, now I know a lot of you are wondering why we chose someone from the Naval War College <laughs> to come and head the Carter Center, which of course is devoted to waging peace. And he said, I'll tell you why. We have a new motto. It's peace or else. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And as to how a diplomat ended up at the Naval War College, well, first of all, um, I was, I like living in Atlanta, but I was stunned when I found out that there was a new law that allows you to carry concealed in church. So I can tell you there are more guns in churches in Georgia than there are on the Naval War College campus. It is a graduate school for, na for naval officers destined for senior positions. Um, the Naval War College is the oldest and best in the world of what's called professional military education. And it, uh, I keep saying we, but it's been more than a year. It grants um, a master's degree in national security and strategic studies, and it's accredited to do that by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. So that's what it is. It's the Navy's graduate school. Um, and the purpose, elaborated in 1884 by the founder, Admiral Stephen B. Luce, was to study not only war, but the prevention of war and the statesmanship connected with war. So um, I found it an easy fit on those two last counts. This is by far our most popular question. How is President Carter's health? I knew someone was gonna ask, otherwise I would have said, well, he is amazing. He is truly amazing. And um, I, um, I was present at the press conference and it was really one of the most memorable events of my life. Now since then, he has undergone radiation treatment for the melanomas that were in his brain, and he's undergone four treatments of a new drug uh, to, to, to battle the cancer itself. 
I can never remember the generic name of the drug, but it was um, created by Merck, and it's marketed as Keytruda. And what it is not is a traditional chemotherapy uh, poison, basically, that, um, that assaults the cancer and, and hopes you survive. <laughs> it, it's actually an immune system boosting drug. So it can make you tired, and I think, although he won't admit it, that perhaps has happened to President Carter. But he is not um, having to go through a chemotherapy that um, is such a, such a draining experience. As a result, he is his usual, with all due respect, sir, energizer bunny self. <laughs> and um, and, and uh, he's as, as sharp as ever. So we don't really know anymore. I think his next, um, the next time he'll know more about how effective the treatments have been is in early December. In your experience as an ambassador and diplomat, what are important qualities to keep in mind when seeking to make changes in policy? Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I spoke about policy recently at the CDC. And I was invited to do that because I was told that the scientists at the CDC are such purists, they can never understand why the scientifically best um, uh, way of doing something is not always the policy. And the example they gave me, and I'm straying, this is, this is me talking, this is not a Carter Center, um, nothing that we've ever discussed at the Carter Center. The example they gave me when they invited, invited me to speak was, well, for instance, why don't we ban smoking in public housing? We all know smoking is bad for us. And my first reaction was, are you kidding? It's bad enough to be poor, and now you're taking away a liberty from the poor who, <laughs> you know, that the rest of us enjoy. That's the question. The question is, so that was, I'm not sure that's my final view, but I, want, I did then agree to go speak about policy because I wanted to point out that in a democracy, we all know this, it's a very messy process. And there are many, many viewpoints that are not necessarily the most scientifically compelling, but that are also relevant and um, deserve a hearing in our democracy. So, um, so I, I think, uh, but I, I, I tell young people that you have to be a very articulate advocate for your point of view. Because in a policy making room in Washington, and I've been in many, even if only as a note taker, the, it's not always the best idea that wins the day. It's the best idea and the most articulate um, and charismatic defender of that idea. And sometimes the best idea is lost because the proponents of that idea have not, uh, don't have the skills to persuade and, and explain that they need. So it's a messy process, but there is no other way in which we can make policy in a democracy. Can you talk a little bit about the center's work in election monitor monitoring? Are you welcomed? Uh, what are the logistics behind that? Okay, because a lot of, the Carter Center is sending a delegation to Myanmar, which I, who serve there, know as Burma, on, uh, on Sunday, and the logistics are quite daunting. First of all, we always go, we only go when we're invited. Um, so by definition, we're always more or less welcome. Now sometimes, our reports are not welcome. And in the early days, President Carter, for instance, had to flee Togo in the middle of the night for the relative safety of Benin. Uh, because uh, the government was so unhappy with the Carter Center's report about the election. And he called Noriega a thief to his face, also had to leave Panama quickly <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> Governments have become more sophisticated since then, frankly, both in the way they seek to, um, to ensure a favorable outcome of the election and in their tolerance for, for some criticism. But the Carter Center celebrated its 100th election monitoring mission in Guyana, of all places, in, um, in May. And this is really interesting because it's a small country on the Mosquito Coast, 500,000 people. The current government had been in power for 23 years when President Carter was there with a mission to monitor an election that threw out the former, uh, the former government and brought in this new government. Um, and this time, the government, after 23 years, lost the election. And I honestly believe that President Carter's behind-the-scenes phone calls 
uh, basically telling the leaders of the losing party that it was time to move on, um, ensured that the results of the election were accepted without, without violence. Um, and that's just one example. In Myanmar, we're going to be walking a, a, a fine line. It's a wonderful thing that the military government committed to elections and is holding them. But there are many, many imperfections in the system that mean that the election um, uh, is, uh, is, is, not, is already uh, not consistent, fully consistent with international norms. Um, we deploy between 30 and 60 short-term observers. They go out in teams. Um, and uh, they go out ahead of time. They're there when the polls open. They can visit a number of polls every day, I'd say. Uh, depending on the size of the country, in Burma, which is pretty large ge geographically, they, each team might get to eight or 10 in a day. Um, they watch when the empty ballots are counted. They watch when the, the, the filled out ballots are counted at the end of the day and counted and recounted. Um, and um, they really do provide a uh, an assurance that a large-scale fraud on voting day is not possible. Of course, we also deploy about a half dozen or more long-term observers because the best election fraud takes place well before election day. And I'll give you an example from Bangladesh, um, it, which came to our attention. Uh, people voted peacefully, uh, legally, on election day, but we learned that several weeks before the election, um, some villages had been targeted by motorcycle riders who came through town with bullhorns and basically said, if you vote on election day, we will torch your village. And essentially, they had simply calculated that the people in this village, they knew the people in this particular village, were proponents of the other party. And so, they, and so that, was a, a very, well, that would be, a, as you can see, a very difficult kind of fraud to uh, to uncover. So as I said, people have become more sophisticated, so it's still important to, uh, to validate elections when the result really is the voice of the people. Ambassador Peters, thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll take this as a small token of our appreciation oh, for you, you, and I hope that you will share with Mr. and Mrs. Carter uh, the joy that we experienced today in remembering and looking back and, and giving them our best wishes. I certainly shall. Very good. Thank you very much. Will the two student groups please make their way to the front? Thank you for coming. Please watch our website for upcoming events. Happy Halloween.